Hey everybody, welcome to our webinar, to Data Umbrella's um, April webinar. Um, so a quick uh, agenda, I'm gonna do an introduction and then Oriel is going to do his talk um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, but you're welcome to post any questions on the chat or in the Q&A tab. And so Oriel will sort of answer the questions when it's a good time for a break or it may be at the end, but um, not to worry, your questions will get answered. And this webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube, hopefully within a day or so. A little bit about Data Umbrella. Um, we are an inclusive community for underrepresented persons in data science and we are a volunteer run organization. Uh, about me, I'm a statistician and data scientist. I have a master's in statistics and an MBA uh, from NYU. Um, I'm available on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub at Reshma S, so feel free to follow me um, if you wish. Uh, we have a code of conduct because um, our goal is to make this community welcoming and friendly for everyone. And so it's a, it's a, you know, a ba basic code of conduct. Be kind to others, be professional and respectful. And you know, that applies to what is in the chat as well. Um, so you know, feel free to converse and communicate with us, but also be uh, mindful of the kind of comments that can be posted there. Um, so there are numerous ways that you can support Data Umbrella. Um, the, the first one is just following our code of conduct and contributing to making it a welcoming and collaborative space and friendly and inclusive. We have a Discord where you can ask um, and answer general questions for the community. You can share events, you can share job postings there. And we have the um, initiative for um, editing transcripts for accessibility. We, uh, we try to transcribe each of our webinars um, and then edit them so you know, people, can, um, people can also access them, not just um, by video, but also by print. Another way that you can support our volunteer run organization is to donate to our open collective and we are an open collective as data umbrella. We have, um, we have um, put together a really nice library on YouTube of all of our webinars, um, thanks to COVID because these used to be all in person events and now they're virtual and we have a number of playlists and one of the playlists is contributing to open source and so there are videos for the numpy video is really great scikit-learn um, pandas is there as well as core python um, so check it out we also have a video um, playlist on a very popular topic which is career advice and um, getting jobs in data science. And so we have three excellent speakers, Emily Robinson, Ali, and Megan. And um, you know, feel free to check out those videos as well. And this is um, a brief overview of some of the various topics we have uh, primarily related to data science. We also have a job board and it is at jobs.dataumbrella.org. So if you have any job postings, feel free to post them there. If you're looking for a job, check out the job board. And also there is an option over here for a weekly digest where you can um, subscribe to get like a weekly update of new jobs that have been added. Our website has um, a plethora of resources on conferences, open source, guides to inclusive language, allyship, burnout, AI ethics, and a lot more. Um, so, you know, check that out um, sometime when you get a chance. We are on almost all social media platforms and depending on your preference and what you use most often, you can find us at Data Umbrella. Um, Meetup is the best place to join because that's where the events are first posted. And YouTube is a good place to subscribe to. I'll post the links. Um, this handout, it's under the handout section, but I'll, I'll post some of these links in the chat as well. Um, so YouTube is where the videos are posted. We're active on Twitter and we're active on LinkedIn. Uh, so to introduce today's speaker, it is Oriol Abrilapla, and I hope I pronounced that right. Um, um, Oriol is a, ba a Bayesian statistics and open source software enthusiast currently um, pursuing a PhD in computer science at Helsinki University in Finland. 
and he is also a member of the archive and pi i don't know if i pronounced that pi mc teams and you can find oreo on github and twitter as oreo of europe okay um, and uh, a plug for our next event um in it is may we're having a event by uh, Louisa Rubo on getting your hands on real astronomy data. And this is a really, I've actually heard her speak before. It's a great talk. And it's, it's actually not just about getting astronomy data, but it's also understanding image processing that they use from these images from space. Um, you know, she really explains this, the whole color, um, the, the color channels and all of that really well. So, um, you know, definitely feel free to uh, sign up or watch for the video if, um, if that date doesn't work for you. And with that, I will hand it over. I'm going to put myself on mute and turn my camera off and hand it over to Oreo. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can all hear me well. Uh, OK. So. Perfect. Uh, can everyone see my slides uh, correctly? They should say uh, intuitive Bayesian modeling with uh, PyMC3. Great. Uh, let's uh, get started then. Uh, this uh, talk uh, will have uh, two main parts. The first one is a, a bit more explanatory and with uh, some uh, background introduction, more theory based. Uh, and I have tried to organize it uh, as an onion-like structure. So I will start talking about uh, general introduction to Bayesian statistics with a focus on, on the tools that we'll use then in probabilistic programming. And finally, move to PyMC3, which is a library to pro do probabilistic programming in, in Python. And in the second half, uh, I will show two examples from the community about PyMC3 usage, which I, I hope that will showcase some of its capabilities and be interesting to most of you. So uh, to begin with, uh, we will be talking about the Bayesian paradigm. And in the Bayesian paradigm, data is uh, considered fixed used to be random, but once you observe this data and you stored it into your notebook, spreadsheet, uh, whatever, this is now considered fixed. These are your observations. And uh, the model parameters themselves are treated as random, even if they may not be. They are treated as random. This is useful because this allows to uh, think in terms of probabilistic distributions and always make our estimations and inference based on probability statements. Uh, to th this kind of probability statements are generally written in this uh, implication of P of theta uh, slash Y. This means that we are obtaining the probability of our parameters uh, represented as theta conditioned on the data that we have observed, which this is generally the question that we want to ask, because we want to know how probable are our parameters, parameters in our model, given the data we have observed, not the other way around. Uh, this formulation is uh, generally referred as inverse probability, because it uh, infers the parameters of the model from the observations, so from uh, effects to causes, which is the, the backwards way of, of thinking. And uh, as, as I was saying, this uh, formulation about going from our observations to our parameters is what allows to actually answer the questions we care about, not uh, getting the probability of uh, the observations conditioned on some parameter values. 
because this can be very different. And the relation between these two kinds of probabilities that I was talking about uh, is given by this uh, short formula, which was actually recently referred in, in the news as a very obscure mathematical theorem, uh, which it allows us to, to make the change between this uh, probability of our parameters given the observations or the probability of the observations given some parameters. Uh, to do this change, uh, you will see that we also have this probability of theta, which is what we called the prior probability. And this is a, a key uh, concept in, in Bayesian statistics. And it is very controversial, but uh, it, in my opinion, I, I don't think it should be because all of the models have a lot of assumptions at all of their steps, like the probability of y given theta, which is generally called the likelihood, also have a lot of uh, assumption needs. So no part in, in the modeling is objective and we should just be explicit on our subjective assumptions for, for modeling. And the prior distribution encodes uh, any and, and all information that we have about the, the model and, and its parameters. And it can go from physical constraints, like for instance, uh, if one parameter were the density of a rock, it cannot be larger than the density of pure iron or the density of a, a, an atomic nucleus. Uh, there can also be model constraints, like variables that represent rates or variances cannot be negative, uh, things like that. There are also work uh, done in order to encode fairness constraints into priors. And whenever you don't have uh, many or any information available about uh, your priors, you can always use uh, weekly informative priors or do other techniques like prior sensitivity analysis to make sure that your prior is not affecting your results to match, things like that. Uh, as we were saying, this uh, framework, this Bayesian paradigm, allows us to uh, reason in terms of probability statements, uh, which is much more informative than using point estimates. To take the example here, we have three distributions, and all of these distributions have the mean at the same uh, place, let's say at zero. So this means that all distributions are uh, giving a, a specific information about the parameter, which is that the probability of the parameter being uh, larger than zero is 50%. However, if we only looked at the mean uh, and the standard deviation of these distributions, we would probably assume that the parameter that has this right school distribution has a much larger probability of being positive when it's not the case. So uh, now we move to probabilistic programming, which is uh, one framework in order to try to move all of this uh, Bayesian paradigm into something more practical. So uh, probabilistic programming languages define uh, base probabilistic distributions, transformation, uh, autoregressive models, Gaussian processes, any building block that you can think for a, for a model, so that then users can combine all these models at will to build virtually any kind of model, much like one commands com, uh, combines commands in uh, regular programming languages to generate any kind of custom program or a specific task. You can build models that are specific to your task at hand and ask, uh, answer the, the question that you really care about. Uh, probabilistic programming also uh, allows us to very easily uh, use generative modeling. So by defining these models using these probability distribution building blocks, 
we can directly calculate probabilities for the parameters uh, and for the data and, and, and we can do many more things like I was saying transforms and, and so on but uh, we also have the distribution of each of the parameters in our model via the, the prior so uh, pro some probabilistic programming languages are able to take this information and sample synthetic data uh, in a very cheap way both in terms of compute and developer time which is really interesting because this allows a lot of checks about making sure that the model is coherent that the model is calibrated and so on to be done uh, virtually for free and uh, one of the key features of probabilistic programmers is uh, programming languages is that they uh, come with uh, inference algorithms that uh, allow to approximate the posterior this probability of the parameters giving given our observations automatically so you only need to define the model and this means that you can use the latest uh, cutting edge inference algorithms without having to write them yourself from scratch they are tested and maintained by a lot of people uh, which are probably then more efficient than what you would be able to write on your own and this is a bit tangential to the to the talk at hand but if you use something else to build your, to build your model you should probably also consider uh, using the inference algorithms in PPLs to fit that model even your even if you're not build, building the model with a PPL So now uh, to PyMC3. So what, what makes PyMC3 uh, special and why do I think that it's an amazing programmistic programming library? First of all, uh, PyMC3 syntax uh, is concise and, and clear and it also follows uh, mathematical notation quite closely uh, as you'll see in, in the examples and the relation to the mathematical notation i think that it's actually a double edged sword in that it's very useful for mathematicians to get uh, easily into probabilistic programming and into programming in general thanks to uh, this uh, easy parallelism and it's also easy for programmers to understand uh, math notation via pymc3 because of this parallelism again so I think that this is also a cool feature. PyMC3 is uh, Python driven. It is built on top of ISARA. This is uh, related to, to one of the questions. So uh, the version three of PyMC3 uh, was built on top of Theano and we are now working on the next major version, which is uh, PyMC3 version four which will be built on top of ISARA, not on, on top of TensorFlow. So we, we explored the TensorFlow uh, avenue for a while, but we found that uh, forking Theano and maintaining Theano ourselves, uh, only focusing on the capabilities that we actually care about in this uh, new ISARA library is a much more powerful approach. And I can actually share a link afterwards about uh, a talk by Chris Fonesbeck, the uh, creator of PyMC, about the past, uh, present, future, and, and PyMC, which goes uh, into this with, with a lot more depth. And this uh, being Python driven is uh, very interesting in the sense that you can mix it with Python code seamlessly and use PyMC in any other pipeline that you have with, with your core and Python code. And PyMC3 is also uh, extensible, both by, by construction and thanks to being uh, Python driven. So you can easily extend uh, PyMC3 by subclassing the PyMC based distributions to create new ones that are specific to your uh, use cases. You can use Namba to accelerate expensive computations within the model. Uh, you can, for instance, uh, 
use uh, numerical approximations via stats models to quickly see if uh, a model will work or not in, in prime C3. And then if you need to put that into production, then go a uh, lower level and write a blazing fast ISR implementation of the same model, uh, which will also be more accurate because it will have out diff instead of uh, numerical differentiation. And it is also community driven. So PyMC3 is a community project that is also volunteer run and it integrates with uh, the rest of the PyData stack. And there's many libraries in multiple domains built on top of PyMC3. And in addition to that, uh, PyMC integrates with uh, other libraries. The PyMC team also contributes to other affine libraries too. Uh, for instance, uh, Arvis, which is a library for uh, post-processing and exploratory analysis of the results that you get from uh, probabilistic programming languages, not only uh, PyMC3, but PyMC3 is very closely integrated with that. So you can, for instance, uh, use Stan to sample your model, then uh, convert this model to the Arvis uh, data framework and use PyMC3 to generate predictions from that model, thanks to this Arby's integration. So there are a lot of uh, cool avenues and opportunities. Uh, let me check that I haven't missed any big question uh, until now. Uh, so just the questions we go. So, what could we visualize the prior distribution? Yes, so uh, as I was saying in the uh, generative modeling uh, point, you can generate samples from the prior distribution that you can then uh, pass to, to Arvis and Arvis will generate uh, a lot of visualization from that and you can also use the samples for extra custom uh, visualizations. Uh, Yes, the, it, it is ISRA, and I also want to note that uh, PyMC4 uh, is the name that we gave to this uh, experimentation with TensorFlow, and the ISRA-backed PyMC will still be called PyMC3, and most of the code will run uh, from PyMC3 version 3 to PyMC3 version 4 without uh, breaking. So this should be useful. And yes, the probability of theta given y is uh, the likelihood. So the, the basic terms of this uh, obscure bias theorem are the likelihood, which is the probability of theta given y, and the prior probability, which is the probability of uh, theta. Um, Okay, uh, I think that th these were uh, all the questions for now. Uh, feel free to, to keep asking questions in while, while I'll go. Uh, now we'll, uh, we'll go to the second half of the, of the talk, which is about uh, PyMC in practice. So I will cover two examples. The first example is uh, from coal mining disasters and this comes from the original paper from PyMC3 uh, that was published in PRG Computer Science. Uh, and this will, example will showcase uh, how intuitive and concise it is to write and fit models in PyMC3, even in cases like this one, which uh, you have discrete parameters and even a switch point, which are generally difficult to, to model. So this is our data, and you can see that uh, in, in the early days, there were many more uh, mining disasters than more recently. And we believe that there was a change in the regulation of mining operations. That is the one that was responsible for this uh, decrease. So we will model this as a switch point in that uh, the number of uh, disasters will be a Poisson distribution because this is a discrete uh, value and it's positive. And this uh, 
Poisson distribution will have a parameter lambda one for the early steps. And then after this switch point that we are modeling, we will change to a much lower uh, lambda two parameter for this Poisson distribution. So we start uh, with this. Uh, this would be the likelihood term because we have this observed keyword. So we are conditioning that on these observations. Uh, and we are using that the likelihood is the Poisson of a given rate. This rate uh, we can define with a switch so that if uh, the time is larger, the, the, the year is larger than the switch point, we are using uh, E from early for if the uh, years are after the switch point, we will use L for the late rate. We can then give uh, a discrete uniform uh, prior to this uh, switch point parameter in order to say that any of the years that we have in the data set are, have equal probability of having the switch point in it. Then we add uh, exponential distributions to the rate parameters to uh, say that these need to be positive parameters and that we believe that their mass is more or less around zero. Uh, let's, uh, I'm not sure I can widen the, the blackboard. I'll try at, at the, I'll try, give me a second. But yeah, so basically it is that we are not expecting these uh, rates to be uh, values of thousands uh, because otherwise we'd have much longer things like that. Okay. Uh, it looks like I cannot make this larger. I don't know why I'm seeing this. Uh, I, I will try to fix that afterwards so that uh, the slides can be uploaded uh, in the correct way. And once we have uh, built this, this model, we can is the order of the equations important for pi MC3? Uh, the order itself is not important, but uh, this is uh, probabilistic programming, which is still programming. So for instance, you can see that uh, to define the rate, we need to know S, E, and L. So the order of S, E, and L can be an interchanged because these are independent statements, but they all three have to come before the definition of rate and disasters have to come after the definition of rate because otherwise things would break. Uh, and once we have this uh, model, we can sample from it with something as, as simple as pm.sample and pymc3 will automatically choose uh, the sampling algorithm for us. So you can see that in this case, it has chosen a compound step, which is using a metropolis sample for the switch point and the Nats sample for the late rate and the early rate. And this is because the Nats sampler is one of the most efficient uh, samplers that we know uh, currently but it can only be used for continuous parameters. So the switch point, which is a discrete parameter, needs to be uh, sampled with this uh, metropolis step. Uh, yes, uh, the distributions for S, E, and L are the priors for the, for the model. And the distribution for the disasters variable is the, the likelihood that we indicate using the same distribution because after all distributions are, are always the same and we condition on the observed data via this observed uh, keyword argument and uh, i will go into model hierarchical uh, in this next example but it won't be done via the model instance it will be i, I actually won't show the code but you can look at in the code because i I provide the, the link. 
So the next uh, example is about uh, housing prices in Berlin. Uh, I will go uh, and give an overview of, of this example, but you can check uh, a much in-depth uh, video by Corey at uh, PyCon uh, Deutschland and PyData Berlin. This is like a macro conference, it's not two different conferences. Uh, I, I was very confused by that at first. So uh, this second example, as, as I was saying on, on hierarchy, will showcase this very popular feature of Bayesian modeling, which is uh, hierarchical models. So we uh, want to predict the price of uh, a flat in, in Berlin, given its uh, living area in, in square meters. So looking at, at the data, we can use a, a linear regression because it seems like a, a reasonable choice. However, we, we may not want to consider all of Berlin at, at once. And so w why shouldn't each district have its own slope and, and intercept for, for the model? So we try uh, setting different slopes for, for different districts and we can fit a linear regression on the standout district or a linear regression on another district. And we can see that they indeed seem to have uh, different slopes uh, and everything works fine by fitting simply linear regressions to each district without taking into account that these are all districts in, in Berlin. But uh, this works well because we have uh, many data points in both these districts. If we move to Schoenberg, uh, which has uh, only three data points, we get a terrible fit because uh, it, it doesn't make sense that the, the slope of this is negative so that uh, larger flats uh, cost less money. And while we could uh, set a prior on the slope to force it to be positive, this uh, would probably end up with the slope being zero. Uh, so we want to try to not use a prior for that, but instead use this uh, hierarchical information that we have about our data, which is that all these districts are districts in Berlin. So even if the district has a different slope, uh, these slopes should be more or less similar. They, they, they won't be very, very different. So we can do that in Bayesian modeling and probabilistic programming by uh, creating a higher level so that all the slope parameters are generated from a high level slope distribution that we will also fit during the model so that they are different and each uh, district has its own slope, but uh, they are not too different from one another. This is generally called uh, partial pooling because there is some uh, sharing of information between the, the different uh, districts and, and the slopes won't be too different. Uh, and this is as, as opposed to the complete pooling, which would be what we did at first of uh, each district has its own slope and we consider districts as completely independent uh, data sets or the no pooling approach, uh, which is that uh, all the districts have the, the same slope. And I may have missed, I, I have a certain tendency to switch the complete and no pooling uh, versions with one another. So I, I'll probably check that afterwards because now live I'm having doubts on, on that. So, uh, Corey implemented this uh, hierarchical model with partial pooling uh, on the Berlin data set. And we can see that uh, this gives much more sensible predictions for Schomburg too. And uh, it is also possible to uh, build models 
in Biome C3 and then use these models as distributions for uh, another model and introduce model hierarchy kit this way. But this can be a bit uh, confusing and, and difficult to, to track. So in general, most applications define this hierarchy by, by themselves, as you see in Ed Corey's uh, code examples. And the potential of PIME CC and probability programming doesn't stop here. So one very uh, interesting thing too is that you have defined this uh, likelihood at, at the end when you condition up the observations, when we had, for instance, in the disasters example, and we assume that this likelihood was only uh, a Poisson of this uh, rate parameter, but we could add more effects to this uh, rate parameter. So we could have one switch point, uh, multiple switch points, another effect and not take into account only the year, but also the atmospheric conditions. And it's very easy to incorporate all these different effects. You just have to add one more line and then uh, add or subtract or multiply on, on the rate, and that's it. And this is uh, the end of my examples. So for some acknowledgments, this talk is uh, heavily inspired, as you have already seen, by many other people in the Bayesian community and from the PNC world. Uh, mostly uh, Thomas Wecky, Chris Van Esbeck, Corey Bartholheimer, and, and Al Nomi, uh, from whom I have uh, taken pieces of slides or talks, talks or examples in order to uh, showcase uh, PIMC capabilities uh, in, in this way that I thought that would be um, interesting because uh, I have given you uh, an overview and if you now like this uh, content, you can go and check uh, uh, an example in much more detail so you know where, where you go. And uh, in addition to the couple examples that I have shared, uh, where to go next uh, in order to uh, continue learning about PyMC3. So PyMC3 documentation, which has uh, a lot of examples that we are currently in process of updating. To, to work with the next major version and to show current uh, best practices in Bayesian modeling. We also had a conference around PIMC completely online and all the talks are publicly available on Discourse. Uh, you have them here. You can also go to Discourse to ask any questions on about PIMC and we'll do our best to, to answer them. And there is also a Learn by Asian Statistics podcast, which is not specific to PyMC3, but is hosted by one of the PyMC developers. And this uh, explores uh, by Asian statistics in, in general with a, a focus on probabilistic programming. But uh, there's uh, people and uh, from Python, from R, from the Julia world, so you can get a much wider view of everything that that happens around probabilistic programming. And uh, now I wait a little bit to see if there are any more questions. And if there are not, uh, or before going into these uh, extra questions, I can also talk a little bit about my experience in getting into PyMC open source and, and so on. Uh, so what code in PyMC can from the form factor? Uh, yes, uh, let me uh, actually I can show the code I'm in practice. Got yes. So this is uh, Corey's repo, notebooks. Uh, I think this is in base models. 
that this should be faster to load. Reset on linear base model and Uh, hierarchy. Okay. Okay. So as you can see uh, in in the model example now, uh, we define this uh, mu alpha and sigma alpha and mu beta and sigma beta, and these are called uh, the hyperparameters because these are what define these uh, higher level priors, and then we generate alpha and beta as normal draws. From a distribution that has mean mu beta or mu alpha and sigma beta and sigma alpha so that they will all be more or less close to this mu beta and the sigma beta governs how different this this can be um, yes i can share the link in the chat uh, to And I can also share the link to the slides, actually. There isn't a functionality to directly specify uh, hierarchical models in PyMC3, but there are, uh, there's a, another package called Bambi that allows to do this with a formula-based uh, approach, like one would do uh, if you know R. Uh, and there's also a, a very similar package, which is uh, more uh, mature in R, that uses stand instead of PyMC3 called BRMS. Uh, can I use PyMC3 to find floors in otherwise Poisson or Gaussian noise? Uh, I, I don't really know. I, I guess that uh, you, you can, but uh, I, I have no knowledge about these specific applications to, to speak with any sense. Um, let's see if I know where to stop sharing my screen. Uh, uh, okay. Here it is. Stop sharing. OK, uh, so uh, before the, the talk, we were speaking uh, uh, with uh, Rishama. And she said that it would also be interesting to, to speak a little bit about my own journey in, in open source and, and statistics and, and so on. And I actually took a bachelor degree in physics engineering plus a master's in astrophysics. and. It was during the masters that I started uh, working with Bayesian modeling and, and so on. And so that this uh, was m more interesting to, to me. So uh, in the early 2019, I started looking into the libraries that I had been using during my masters in order to do this uh, Bayesian modeling uh, for, for astrophysical models and applied to Google Summer of Code. Uh, with Arbis, and I have the luck to be selected for, for my project. And after Google Sum of Code, I joined uh, the Arbis and the PyMC3 projects, uh, which I, I had also been working with during, during the summer. And since then, I started progressively getting more, more and more uh, involved. 
uh, and now uh, here I am. So it, it has been kind of a, a quick journey, but uh, I have found uh, open source to be a really uh, enjoyable and enriching experience in that it has allowed me to learn uh, many things that I would not have been able to learn in other uh, avenues. And I have also met a lot of people which have helped me on, on the rest of, of my journey. And I am now, uh, as Rishama said in, in the introduction, pursuing a, a PhD in computer science and statistical computing, which uh, has nothing to do with uh, my previous uh, academical formation. Yes, uh, Google Summer of Code uh, applications closed very recent, very, very recently, actually, in April 13th. Uh, but this is a project that happens every year, so you should uh, check the, the website uh, for next year if you are interested in, in participating in that. And uh, there is a related project called, uh, well, project or, or initiative or, or whatever, called uh, Google Season of Docs, which is not for programming, but for uh, writing documentation for open source libraries. And these are the, the applications for uh, Season of Docs are open right now. So if any of the, the listeners are interested in technical writing, in addition to programming, uh, you should check this out. Season of Docs. This year, uh, we were extremely lucky, and both Arby's and, and PyMCC have been uh, selected. So if you are interested in, in data science and, and statistics and technical writing, you should definitely check this out. And In, in astronomy during my master's, I worked mostly on uh, cosmology models. Uh, and my master thesis was about trying to use uh, photometric data uh, from 40 narrow filters instead of using uh, spectroscopic data in order to try to infer fluxes from emission uh, lines. Uh, and I tried to do that uh, with policy programming, but uh, it, it, it was a too complicated project for a, a master thesis. So I only got uh, bad results overall. And I uh, am also uh, interested in exoplanets. And I, one of my, uh, colleagues from from the masters. Uh, she's a great uh, astrophysicist and is currently doing uh, her PhD at uh, MIT working on, on exoplanets. And I sometimes uh, collaborate with her on, on that end. But uh, I focus on statistical and, and PIMC and not so much in, in the actual exoplanet models. Does, does anybody have any additional questions? I think I think Oriel, you will you will definitely connect with uh, Louisa's presentation next month on astronomy <laughs> and exoplanets. It's really um, definitely yes. Yeah. Or maybe it's yes. exactly what you have done. So it I mean, it doing my math thesis is one of the the key things to take into account was uh, how we got the fluxes from the images, actually. Mm -hmm. So I, I did not work on that, but there were other people working on that. 
and I could use uh, a couple of parameters to tweak uh, how the classes were calculated. Like you generally have this one dot in, in the picture, mm -hmm. which looks very round, but it, it's not round. It's like uh, if you look at the intensity profile, it's smooth. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to choose a cat in order to decide only the flags inside this uh, circle is the one that I'll take into account. And you can make this larger or smaller, even uh, make it an ellipsoid, things like that. So it, it, I, I think this will be a very, very interesting talk. Okay. Okay. All right, um, if anybody has any more questions, now is the time to ask. Um, and otherwise you can find Oreo on GitHub and on Twitter. Yes. And so um, this video, um, I'll have it up soon and I will copy all the links that have been posted in the chat into the video description so people have access to it um, in a handy fashion. Um, and um, okay, yeah, and with that, um, I am going to um, end the webinar.